Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to take a look at a specific song and do an analysis of it as per a request I received. So the song I picked that I want to look at today is Claire de Lune by Debussy, which is a song that most of us are familiar with. And if you're not sure if you know it by the title, we'll play an audio clip in a second so you can get a feel for it. So in today's episode, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the history of the piece. We're going to talk a little bit about the interpretation and the musical style and all that good stuff. I want to avoid making this a really technical academic analysis though. So if that's what you're looking for, you probably won't enjoy this video. But the way I was thinking as per the title of this video, I want to make this accessible to even just like the average standard music listener who doesn't necessarily know a whole lot about music theory. But that being said, I want to strike a balance between providing substance, but also not watering it down too much. So let me know in the comments how I do, and then I can kind of tweak it and improve it in the future if this is the kind of video that you guys like. So let's get started. So Claire de Lune isn't actually even a standalone piece. It's part of a larger whole, which is a suite that's called the Suite Bergamasque. It was published in 1905 by the French composer Claude Debussy. So this means it was written in the 20th century era of music, which is also referred to the modern era. If you think about it, 100 years ago, it might not seem that modern, but if you compare it to, you know, like music from 1,000 years ago, it's fairly modern in that sense. So in this Suite Bergamasque, Claire de Lune is the third movement, and there's four movements total. The title is French for Moonlight, and it's based off a poem, actually, by Paul Verlaine. So this was a popular thing that composers like to do, is take a poem and then make music for it, like to evoke the feeling. It's actually a super awesome poem, even the translation. So I'll link the English translation below if you want to check out the full thing. But before we get too into it right now, let's just take a quick listen to the introduction of Claire de Lune, in case you haven't heard it or you need just a refresher. It's interesting because we have this perception of Claire de Lune being this super immaculate, beautiful song, which it is, but in the context of the entire sweet Bergamasque, it really stands out. So a Bergamasque is basically a clumsy clown dance, like the, well, you don't have to be a clown to do it, but it's like a clown-ish dance. So kind of like an exaggerated dance you do if you were just having a good time, joking around, being silly. So I find it interesting that such a tender, lovely piece like Claire de Lune would be part of a collection of tunes about clumsy dancing, but but if you especially take a listen to the minuet, uh, which is the second movement, you can definitely hear a little bit of that goofiness coming through. It also isn't entirely random that Debussy threw in this tender, gentle piece in the middle of a rather oddball assortment of tunes. In the poem Claire de Lune, Ber Bergamasks are referenced in the second line. And this is the poem, this is the English version of the poem that he based Claire de Lune off of. So whether you're just learning how to play the song or appreciating it or whatever it happens to be, it's really important to know where where Debussy was coming from as a songwriter. He was really opposed to the romantic style of predictable chord patterns and structures and things like that, so he avoided that. Instead, Debussy is quoted as saying that, I should like to see the creation of a kind of music free from themes and motives or formed on a single continuous theme, which nothing interrupts and which returns upon itself. Then there will be a logical, compact, deductive development. There will not be, between two restatements of the same characteristic theme, a hasty and superfluous filling in. Basically, his intent wasn't to write a catchy tune, but rather to create an experience, to create a song that could set a scene and then take you through it. Claire de Lune doesn't have a formal structure, but it can actually be loosely divided into three different sections, which is a type of ternary form or three-part form. So you start with the A section as always, and then... A couple pages in, you hit the B section, was a lot, which is a lot more rapid and has a lot more movement. And then towards the end of the song, you return to the A section, but it's not a replica. It's a little bit different than the first time around. So you already heard the introduction at the beginning of this video, the first sound clip. It's very sparse and it almost lacks a distinctive rhythm. So Claude Debussy has a quote that goes something like, music is the space between the notes. And you can really feel his meaning just by the intro alone. There's a lot of open and empty space in the first part, a lot of long held notes, which is 
Honestly, just as captivating as if there were a lot of like fast, crazy notes, like in the second sec section. One of my favorite parts of this whole piece, and one of the most recognizable parts, I think, is on the second page right here, where all the notes come together, are played at the same time, still quietly, but it's super powerful. So let's take a listen to that. So without going too far with the musical jargon, the tonality never really feels truly secure in this piece. So tonality is when you say this song is in the key of C major, or in this case, we got D flat major or whatever it happens to be. So certain chords strengthen and emphasize the tonality of a piece, like the use of tonic and dom dominant chords. So the two tones that would really strengthen the key signature D flat major would be the D flat major chord and also the A flat major chord, which is the dominant. But what Debussy is doing here is creating tonal ambiguity. So you never really feel secure in this key, which is as we've talked about D flat major. So what he does to create this ambiguity, there's a couple things, but one way, which you can see right from the opening notes, is he never actually, even though we're outlining a D flat major chord here, there's no D flat major. It's almost like it's over here where you get your first D flat note, almost like an afterthought. So you don't get like a strong, secure sense of it being a D flat major. And there's also no A flat major chords in here that would also give it strength. In the second page, the music starts growing in agitation, which is featuring some of Debussy's characteristic rule breaking when it comes to chords. So he didn't choose clusters of notes to adhere to any standard. So I assume he chose them for the specific mood they created or the ambience, even if, and maybe even especially if they were dissonant. So let's take a listen to those dissonant chordal parts in this page as they peek into this beautiful rolled high note part that always sort of reminds me of a harp and that's what leads us into the second section. So the B section is when things really start rolling along and get interesting in this piece. So it becomes a lot more technically demanding than the first part, but just because the first part is like physically simpler, there's not a lot of like big arpeggios or anything like that. It's got so much subtlety that it's still almost as challenging as this B section, even though it's a faster part. So I wanna take a quick listen to these rolling arpeggios in the left hand, and then you can kind of listen to these right hand, very simple right hand notes peak above this tumultuous left hand part. When you're listening to Debussy, it really helps to keep impressionist paintings in mind. So Debussy's style was really in the same vein, only on piano or, you know, other instruments instead of a canvas. Claire de Lune, like an impressionist painting, is really all about capturing the essence of something, not so much the fine details, but the spirit. So Claire de Lune is decidedly uncatchy, it lacks a really distinctive rhythm, and breaks all kinds of harmonic rules that musicians have been following for hundreds of years, but it does paint a picture, it creates a mood, and it takes us somewhere beautiful. Not in an intellectual, that's a good song kind of way, but in a way that, not to get like too woo-woo on you, but that kind of like tugs at the soul or the spirit. Most of the second section involves running arpeggios and lots of motion. So we are going to take a listen to the climactic moment of this piece. So there isn't a grand crescendo or even like a huge build because Debussy defied those kind of stereotypical song structures, but the moment when all the notes start tumbling downward like a waterfall is definitely in my mind a pinnacle of sorts. It's very, very beautiful.
So part three sees a return to the opening theme, the A section, but it's not an exact replica. So you can still see in the left hand, you have these arpeggio fragments, which I like to think are kind of a, a leftover remnant of the B section to kind of tie it all together. And then you'll see these notes I've highlighted are very similar to the opening A section. So an interesting change from the beginning is that though the beginning of the song implied a D flat major chord and sounded a little bit happier because of it, not that it's like super hunky dory jolly or anything but right here echoing the first part it takes on a little bit more of a melancholic bent because it's got the f minor harmony going on but just so you don't get too comfortable with that f minor it switches over here to f7 with the a naturals instead of it being flat which is like f minor but over here you can see it kind of goes back to that f minor harmony again so we'll take a listen to how it changes how it's familiar and reminiscent of the first part but it's a little bit more melancholic and even mysterious So finally, at the very end of the song, in those last arpeggios that echo the second part, we get that perfect cadence that we've been waiting for the whole time. So this is our dominant tonic harmony that Debussy uses extremely sparingly in his music, just because it's, it's very conventional and creates such a definite, distinct sound. But it, it totally works at the end because it finally gives us a sense of peace and resolution by hearing this cadence. It gives us our tonal footing back and it makes the final notes feel well-earned and satisfying. And that concludes our discussion on Claire de Lune by Debussy. Again, like I mentioned in the video, just let me know in the comments what your thoughts are and if you learned anything and if you want me to do videos like this in the future and if you have any suggestions. Thank you so much and I'll catch you next time. You can probably hear like birds and stuff chirping and I just saw a bumblebee. There are so, oh, that's a, that's a wasp.